Good morning, everyone, and good afternoon, evening, depending on the part of the world where you are. We really want to welcome you, special welcome to join us in this uh, University Social Responsibility Summit. You are specifically have joined to the track two of collaborative research to address global changes. Just an overview, we'll have um, four speakers in some presentation, there'll be co uh, presenters, and each speaker will have about 15 minutes to present. Thereafter, there will be a question and answer session. And please do join the virtual platform in case you also want to raise other questions through that platform. And we'll try by all means to accommodate as many questions as possible. However, if we are not able to address your question due to time constraints, please feel free to engage with our speakers after the, 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 their session via the platform that we have. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I just want to specifically welcome Mariko to this uh, uh, session and she's going to be our first speaker. She is a, a program specific uh, a senior lecturer at the International Strategy Office of Kotio in University. So we just want to acknowledge her a wealth of experience and we're looking forward to hearing from her, given her experience specifically with international cooperation in education and human resource de development. Thank you. Over to you, uh, Mariko. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. You can go ahead. You've got 15 Thank minutes. You. Right. Thank you very much for your introduction. Hello everyone, uh, my name is Mariko Adachi, Program Specific Senior Lecturer of International Strategy Office of Kyoto University. I am very honored to share one of our international strategies on-site laboratory initiative with you. Before getting started, before getting started, let me have a quick introduction of Kyoto University. Our university was founded in 1897 as the second oldest national university in Japan. It was meant to be a research-oriented institution with enduring tradition of pioneering field work. This research-oriented tradition and spirit are the key factors of our university, dedicating to higher education and fostering an atmosphere of free academic exchange. To prove this, we have had 44 off-campus research and education centers in Japan and 66 overseas offices and facilities with 11 Nobel laureates. The initiative on-site laboratory was established in 2018 as one of the programs financed by the Ministry of Education. This initiative is one in a package of strategies for internationalization. The purpose of this initiative is to enhance collaboration with partners to further develop world-leading cutting age research and explore new domains of academic endeavor. To promote international student mobility, increasing the recruitment of talented international students, to expand the collaboration with industry partners, to strengthen uh, institutional infrastructure that enable Kyoto University to be a key player in international academia. Currently, 11 on-site laboratories are operating in the world. Today, I would like to introduce three laboratories, one in US, one in Thailand, and one in China, sharing how unique they have been coping with the global issues. The first on-site laboratory is Kyoto University San Diego Research Center. This laboratory was established in September 2019 by the Graduate School of Medicine in cooperation with the Center for Nobel Therapeutics at the University of California, San Diego. 
The purpose of this laboratory is to accelerate research collaboration, industry academia collaboration, and education collaboration, to develop global human resource through sharing space in the center with, uh, for Nobel therapy with UC San Diego's top researchers. The function of the laboratory is joint research in the field of medicine, recruitment of international students, and expansion of collaboration with industry partners. This on-site laboratory covers a variety of activities. To promote uh, advanced joint research with research, uh, researchers from UC San Diego and other institutions, and support for KU Ventures, to provide early careers, PIs, with management experience opportunities at an overseas laboratory, to offer study abroad orientation for KU graduate and undergraduate students, to promote relationships among researchers, undergraduate and graduate students, to develop human resource through special programs for graduate students, credit exchange, and to provide overseas training opportunities for early career PhDs, researchers, and admin staff. The second case is Kyoto University on-site laboratory at Mahido University Education and Research Collaboration in Environmental Studies. This laboratory was established in March 2019, which is upgraded from a Mahido University facility established in January 2016. It was originally established by the Graduate School of Global Environmental Studies, but since 2020, three graduate schools of Kyoto University, engineering, agriculture, and medicine joint. Partner institution is Mahido University, Thailand, and its location is also at Mahido University. The function of the laboratory is research and education to address environmental engineering issues, recruitment of talented international students, and the provision of international double degree program. I would like to share some of the achievements from the past three years, Japanese physical year 2018 to 2021. This on-site laboratory held five workshops for sharing their research achievement with the global community, reaching over 300 participants online. Additionally, the Kyoto University International Symposium was held in November 2020, which reached to the number out 300 participants. This on-site laboratory was the scenario of the signature for agreement for double master's degree program signed by the Graduate School of Global Environmental Studies in 2016, the Global School of Public Health in 2018, and the Graduate School of Agriculture in 2021. As for mobility, in 2018 to 2019, 17 groups of totaling 52 students from Mahido and 15 groups totaling 57 students from KU visited the partner institution. In 2020 to 2021, only four groups totaling five students visited due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Also, joint lectures, joint research, co-authored research presentations, internships are conducted. The last case is Kyoto University Shinwa 
uh, University Cooperative Research and Education Center for Environmental Technology established by the Graduate School of Engineering and the Graduate School of Global Environmental Studies. This on-site laboratory was established in partnership with Shenzhen International Graduate School, Tsinghua University, China, and its location is also there. The functions of the laboratories are research education in environmental engineering field and international double, double degree program. This on-site laboratory is based on the memorandum of the university concluded by uh, concluded between Kyoto University and Tsinghua University dating back to 1998. Subsequently, in 20, 2001, the university exchange program in University developed the relationship meeting. This on-site laboratory is funded in October 2005, started as an endowed course by a group of companies with a setup of a council. Based on the funds from the related research fund and related project based on the donation from the company in the council. Active law in the council in symposium and international student exchange. Function as a base for exchange between Japanese company and Chinese one. Promote diverse joint research between universities, Japanese company and Xinhua University Chinese company and Kyoto University. The function of the on-site laboratory is to develop new joint research with university, institute, and companies, and to hold a long-term exchange experience. Here, uh, the social impact and global challenge of on-site laboratory. I define the social impact on-site laboratory is that Kyoto University carry knowledge to overseas, creating influences in knowledge, handling technology and behavior. On the other hand, I defined a global challenge for on-site laboratory is that Kyoto University has to fix to implement the laboratory. The last slide is future perspective on-site laboratory. The following four points are expected to be accelerating. First, expanding the research network, which will exchange with local university and companies in promotion of industry academia collaboration, such as joint research. Second, nurturing the next generation with on-site experiences. Third, increasing the mobility for researchers, students, and even admin staff to develop human capacity. Fourth, creating international standards. One good example for this is a collaboration outcome from the third case, Kyoto Shin University Collaborative Research and Education Center for Environmental Technology. Research results on water reuse are beginning to lead to the creation of international standards. Currently, they are collaborating to develop ISOization of water reuse. I should say that we could see more in the future. Thank you very much for your kind attention. If you like to have more information on the on-site laboratory initiative, please visit our website. And then also, if you have any questions, please contact me at the contact ISOKU at the designated email address. I am happy to talk more about on-site laboratory with you. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Barako, for such an informative presentation. And thanks that you stick to your time in terms of the time limit. You still had about the two minutes more, but we appreciate that you're able at least to, you know, to do your presentation within time. Yeah, quite interesting, especially looking at the future world and also in terms of how you work with various partners, including the, the business sector, in particular as a university. Thank you for that. I'll open up for questions right now. If anyone has a question, please raise it now. You're also welcome, like I indicated, to raise it via the chat and type, or you can just ask directly now. Thank you. Thank you. I see there's no question yet on the chat on the virtual platform, but if you have one, like I indicated, you're welcome to raise it, then we can uh, have our speaker address it now. Unless he has invited, you are not limited to this time. In case something comes up after the session, you're still welcome to contact her and have even more direct chat with her. Who knows, there could be also collaborative uh, opportunities to work with her given the kind of work that she's doing. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I don't see any question on the uh, virtual platform as well. So I think we'll take it that the uh, we are happy with this session, but like I said, do feel free to raise questions if they do come up at the later stage and contact our Mariko directly and speak to her. So with that, we then going to move forward to our next session. We still have time and, and it's great that uh, we'll catch up in terms of the, yeah, we started a little bit later, but we'll catch up with that. Our next speakers, these are the two, um, speakers and and you if you want to see their bio they are available there on the platform to see more details i'm not going to introduce them in detail given the, the time constraint but uh, kim and paul if i may start with uh, kim specifically she's the chairperson of the civil engineering and architecture department at, at the naga university and she's engaged with various uh, project with local government and department of science and technology and she leads the project called DG. So that's what they are going to speak about, the, the two speakers. And Paul specifically is a project leader of STEA and other DRR technologies research project with specific focus on hydrophonics with grants provided by the University Research Council of Antio de Manila University. So I just want to welcome them and then say, if you see uh, myself look i'm going to switch off my video now but if you see me switching it on it means you're left with about two three minutes uh, for your presentation then you can wrap up at that particular time thank you over to you thank you g Good afternoon, everyone from the Philippines. I am Kim, and I'm here on behalf of Paul. Uh, so our project is named Dig This Year, Research Collaboration, Repositioning of Assets Before Disaster Strikes. So we have a lot of partners in this project, including Ateneo de Naga University, Ateneo de Manila University, uh, the local government of Naga, Manila Observatory, the National Resilience Council, and the Coastal Cities risk in the Philippines, together with IDRC Canada. All right. Um, as he, we all know, well, tracks and intensity of all tropical storms is, this is a 150-year-old uh, data that is mostly towards the Philippines. If we integrate all this um, sapphire-simpson hurricane scale 
it is translated to Typhoon Category 4 and Super Typhoon Category for the Philippine um, standard. Let's kind of zoom it a bit to our area, Bicol region. We are sitting at the typhoon belt of the Philippines and one of the most vulnerable regions to typhoon due to, due to our location and geography. Three, sorry, two years ago, uh, we experienced three consecutive or four uh, typhoons in the Philippines in the span of three weeks. And this is what is usually the landscape or facade after uh, each and every typhoon. This Catanduanes is a province in the Bicol region. And, sorry, and two years ago as well, I met Paul and Kim after uh, after the typhoon Ulysses, they are installing their post disaster response solar clean water system here in our area in Camarines Sur. There are pH mouse housing models in the Philippines, and the trend is that after each and every typhoon, the need for mass housing and socialized housing increases. However, there is a dearth in the accomplishment, as you can see, for the year 2020, in our uh, in the province of Albay, the requirement or the projected target is 1,382. However, the accomplished only, uh, they only accomplished 240. So from that visit two years ago of Paul's team, uh, the Ateneo Innovation Center, he crafted the project with this peer collaboration. We were thinking, they have these technologies, um, disaster resilient technologies, and we have been advocating in our department to produce a house, a model house that we can use as a laboratory for our future building materials development, for our disaster resilient building materials. And that's how we came up with the Dig Bees Here project. Basically, we have disaster risk reduction. We've been talking about this. A uh, lot of vulnerable communities and countries uh, are talking about how to mitigate um, damage and loss. However, we are more directed or we are more focused on the response. But going going beyond the response, we need to provide anticipatory action. And this is where the project is um, rooting, rooting from. So we need anticipatory action before we dwell into response and promote recovery. So this is gonna um, this aims to en enable capacity so that our systems, our communities will become more resilient and damage and loss which the COP27 is discussing, will be lessened, specifically for areas like ours. This is the framework of uh, our project, the DICTIS here. Um, so we have disasters. Our idea is to provide a house that is disaster resilient and self-sustaining, so that one family at a time or one community at a time, we can provide or promote resilience. So if we have the resilient housing, because as you as you saw earlier, most of the houses in our region are made up of wood materials, they're made up of bamboo and or nika. If you have the housing, the infrastructure, we also need water, food, and energy. So this this is where water, food, energy nexus comes in. So if if they have housing, they also need food during disaster. And through, through this, we also have the recycled concrete technology, a simplified housing construction, together with the DRR technology. All in all, we need academic, LGU, community, and non-government agencies collaboration to make all this possible. And of course, to have an avenue for scale. So this is our framework. Specifically, uh, this is our snap with the family during our uh, MOA assignment. Specifically, there are two 
uh, institutions involved here, Ateneo de Navia University and Ateneo de Manila University. For Ateneo de Navia, we have Big B. It's also a legal term for here. Uh, also asserting that we want the houses to be uh, built in their original locations as much as possible. Most of the mass housing in the Philippines, uh, communities are relocated in far flung areas, uh, away from their, the, the locations where the areas that they grew up with. And it's also one of the risks, uh, one of the risks of this of socialized housing projects because it's all the communities tried to go back to, to the areas that uh, the government evacuated them from. Well, we have three workshops with the communities to co-develop, co-generate, and co-create knowledge and co-develop the technologies and the house. This, all of these are geared towards community resilience development. And also, it's important that we are promoting people-led housing. That's also to one way to capacitate the community. In this project, it's not just engineers that are working, but we also have social scientists, we have philosophers, we have students, we have the community, we also have the local government on board. And that is what sets this project um, or makes this project unique and challenge, challenging for our team. So um, here are some snaps from the activities that we've done. Uh, we conducted the workshop with the family from, from the photo um, the middle. The, we asked the family for their disaster experience that is to ensure that we are being inclusive, that we are asking them for input so that they can co-design the house, even if of course, it needs technical assistance. Uh, it needs more technical assistance, but we wanted to understand, the engineers wanted to understand how they look or they view housing and disaster resilient housing, their idea of what disaster resilient housing is. We also talked with uh, the local government of Naga in the generation or procurement of or sourcing of the concrete materials that will be used. And our students help in developing the concrete panels or the building materials that we use in the construction of the building. So that's also one way to promote collaboration between teachers, the students, the community, the local government. We also had a intern from France and um, our intern helped us see a wider lens about all these things and we conducted a systems thinking workshop so that we can understand better how we are um, how we should move forward with the project with a systems lens and we conducted a series of activities like um, we open the research with uh, for internship. We have interns, we have students, uh, we have guest uh, interns. We had the plastic to bricks campaign in our university and in the community. We are collecting plastic pet bottles that we will be transforming into plastic bricks um, that will be used in the in the house. Uh, here are the technologies developed by our partner, the STEER. Uh, the STEER project is focused on the development of disaster uh, DRR technologies, one of which is the promotion of hydroponic system. Now we're starting with lettuce. We are looking into developing other uh, hydroponic systems for other other pro other produce like black rice and what uh, whatever the community is um, leaned on we also are providing the wastewater treatment for the uh, 
water uh, for the septic tank of, of the house. Um, we're also providing the brick oven and with embedded um, water, sorry, water heating, water heater. Then we're also providing the near cloud system that can accommodate data sharing even without the internet. All these are geared toward making a house or a community of houses resilient to disaster or in the event of disaster and become more self-sufficient and self-sustaining. So moving forward, oh, so the main key findings that we, we found here while, while doing the project is that it's important to have across institution collaborations. Ateneo de Nagan, Ateneo de Manila, or Sister Schools. But it's also equally important to have a good relationship with the local government, with private institutions, with private organizations, and the community in order to provide or in order to implement projects which are addressing complex world problems that are deeper and have and will have more impact in the community. It's also equally important to involve students so that they can, uh, while they're in the university, they can understand better, they can appreciate better the profession and be more and become more, become better in their profession after after university. This is also one way to advance their training while still in undergrad. Definitely, there is a need to increase the LGU academic industry projects here in the Philippines, and which has been the practice already in other neighboring countries. But here in our country, it, we're still starting. So this is one of the projects, the, the few projects here in the Philippines that is promoting LGU academic industry partnerships. And we are looking forward to our phase two. That is the um, community extension and sustainability of the D and Steer. We wanted to have this or to work on how this project will be cascaded from the from the beneficiary, its three families, its three houses, towards the whole community of Panikwason and later to other areas in Naga City and in Bicol and well scaled up to the whole of the Philippines. To end, I would like to take this opportunity to USR for allowing us to share our project and we're excited. If if you have more uh if you need more information and you're interested with this project you may contact me my email and Paul, his email flash on the screen. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thank you, uh, Kim, and also uh, in absentia, Paul. Thank you for such a, again, wonderful uh, and informative presentation. I mean, we know that disasters are there and they're there to stay with us. However, you are not just waiting to be reactive, but you are proactive in terms of forming disasters and resilient systems that are able to assist the community. I must say one of the highlights is the issue of co-designing the, the housing that you are doing with the community, with your students as part of their training. That's a wonderful uh, a training uh, opportunity for students. So keep up the good work. Um, once more, I just want to open this session for questions. As I indicated, I'm also monitoring the virtual platform just to see if any other questions are raised in that uh, uh, platform. So you're welcome to, to raise your hand, just ask or type, then we can uh, address, ask him to address the questions specifically. Thank you.
Okay, I'll give a few more seconds in case somebody uh, uh, raise a question. But otherwise, as indicated, you're welcome to contact our speakers after the session to engage with them further. If something comes up after this uh, uh, opening, I'm giving a few more minutes, seconds for, for questions to raise. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Kim. It seems there is no question at this point, but I believe that uh, some people will contact you given that you have shared your, your, your contacts and they may want to engage uh, with you one to one together with uh, Paul, of course, is uh, your core researcher. Thank you once more. We are going to our third, third um, uh, session right now which is going to be presented by Rene from the University of Rhodes. She's a senior lecturer there, uh, specifically with the uh, Community Development Division within the Rhodes University. And she's got wealth of experience. You can read more in terms of her bio, over two decades in academia. And she's going to speak to us this morning on the subject of epistemic justice, journey from traditional research to engage research. Rene, thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. We can hear okay. you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much and greetings to everyone from Rhodes University in the Eastern Cape in South Africa. So yes, my presentation today will just focus on my journey. So it's, it's also a personal reflection on my growth as an academic, but also as an individual on this journey towards valuing, appreciating, and including all forms of knowledge. So this is just an overview of what my presentation will focus on for today. So just to give context, to engage research, then reflect on my personal journey, then specifically on how, um, you know, becoming an academic or joining the Rhodes University Community Engagement Division how that started my sort of trajectory to becoming an engaged researcher. Then just on CBPR, just a few reflections from uh, participants that have done the course that we've developed, um, as well as reflections from the community. And as I was preparing um, for the presentation, what really came to mind was on this journey of moving from a traditional to an engaged researcher, starting you know, when I was a student in the 90s, um, this journey also, you know, required um, that I learn a lot of things, but, you know, as I moved towards becoming an engaged researcher, I had to unlearn a lot of things and also relearn. And as I was preparing this, um, a quote from Alvin Toffler, you know, really um, stuck with me where he says, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but those who cannot learn unlearn and relearn. And you know, this beautifully sums up my journey. So maybe to just start off, engaged research, um, basically it, it, it looks at engaged research encompasses diverse um, research participa participatory methods and approaches. And what all of these participatory methods have in common is, it focuses on collaboration with the community as opposed to on or in the community. So engaged research approaches very much focuses on the community being included um, in the research process itself. And again, all these methods very much focuses on addressing societal challenges, so real and relevant needs of communities with the main aim of bringing about social change. And, you know, as for my journey as well, uh, engaged research values all forms of knowledge. So it's not just the expert knowledge, but also the everyday lived experience knowledge. And the engaged research actually gets academics and students to ask yourself, um, who identified the issue under investigation or who identified the problem or the challenge that's being investigated? Who will benefit from this um, as it relates to the design of the methodology um, which stakeholders were involved? Were all of them involved? 
um, if they were involved in what capacity, uh, who will be involved in the data collection. After the data has been collected, who will be involved in analyzing the data? And, and then also, how will, be, uh, how will the findings be disseminated? And how will the findings find relevance um, in addressing the, the issue or the problem under investigation? So maybe just to just an overview of CBPR, because that is in essence um, the engaged research program that um, we offer at Rhodes is very much based on community-based participatory research. And on a continuum of community engagement in research, community-based participatory research is the highest form of engagement as it um, looks at the relationship between the university and all stakeholders involved in the research process. So it talks about collaboration, co-creation, and it relies very much on the strengths of all of the stakeholders and also the valuing of the knowledge of all of the stakeholders. And in a perfect world, um, at the highest level in terms of engagement would be community-led research. Uh, but I think, yeah, there's still um, you know, much time to, to still move forward ahead before we can actually get to a community-led. But the beauty about community-based participatory research is it's inclusive of the community and you work in collaboration with them. So I thought just to reflect on my own personal journey, which is very much what my presentation is focused on. <clears throat> so it took me back to the 90s and that gives away my age. As a first year student, you know, I clearly can remember um, orientation week. And it was this organization talking about human rights um, awareness in communities, in prisons, in marginalized communities. And after the presentation, I actually walked up to the lady that facilitated this and I said, wow, you know, I'm really blown away but about you know what you've presented and I'm quite keen to get involved. So she said to me, you know, gave me a business card and said, you know, I'm gonna send an email, which I did the following week. We met up. <clears throat> and then she indicated to me I can join as a volunteer, but they won't be able to pay me. So what they could do is they would cover my transport as well as meals on the days that I volunteer. And that is how my volunteering journey actually started during orientation week of my first year. And what I loved about being involved in volunteering, um, and it started in my first year up until my fourth year, my honors year. <clears throat> and during that time, I grew academically in the sense that I was able now to apply discipline specific knowledge in a real world context, you know, by engaging with communities and um, you know, and people that are different from me in so many ways. So it helped me to be able to apply knowledge in a real world context. And I was also able to see then that theory taught in class at times is applied very differently in a real world context based on, you know, uh, different factors. So it also helped me in my studying, but it also helped me personal growth by getting involved in, in the volunteering. Um, I grew more confident in public speaking, report writing, and I was also able to engage with people, um, you know, from various backgrounds, from various disciplines. And as I said, that are, you know, different from me in so many ways. And this actually opened up the door for me after my honors year to be employed. So through the networking of this volunteering that I did, um, I was actually employed as a junior researcher through this network. So I, I wrote my final exams in November that year, went for an interview in December, and then started in January. So even then, as a junior researcher, the skills um, combined with the discipline-specific knowledge you know, gave me that abilities and skills to come in as a junior researcher and be able to look at research more holistically. So after that, I joined academia. And you know, then as a junior academic, I was able to then have my lectures in a very interactive um, way simply because I also got students then to start applying in, in you know, a lecture setup um, the knowledge and apply it to a real world context. Then after that, my doctoral studies. <clears throat> and again, with all of this still in the back of my mind, but as I was reflecting, preparing this presentation, I also realized as much as I knew the importance of having the community involved um, in research itself. Uh, my, for my doctoral studies, it was politics for that. It was all very one directional um, in the sense that, you know, I, I, I only involved the community when I was collecting my data. So it was one directional and it was for me purely just about um, getting the data. 
And during that time, I mean, the community engaged with me, you know, they shared very personal things with me, hoping that through my research, um, it would bring about change for the issue under investigation. But reflecting on it, it was very much one directional. But in the back of my mind, it was there was a light always going off and just saying, you know, but you, you know, it's just about you, it's just focusing on your students. What about the community? And when I joined Rhodes University, that's now really when you know my trajectory towards becoming an engaged researcher, it really started. Um, and also being involved now in epistemic justice, as I said, the valuing and appreciation inclusion of all forms of knowledge. So when I joined Rhodes University, it then became clear to me, um, you know, transformative and developmental community engagement, that it's about looking at development holistically, but also for community engagement to be that bridge, or as my head of the department normally says, to be that anchor, an anchor institution between the university and the communities where we find ourselves. And also then, um, transformative and developmental community engagement, it's about mutuality, about respect, um, and building and nurturing those relationships. So then, um, we uh, at the time, we were three academics in the division, and then one community partner, the four of us then completed the UNESCO Knowledge for Change Community-Based Participatory um, Mentor Training Program. And it's also during, and this program was facilitated by Victorian University in Canada. And it's during this uh, mentor training that we were exposed to engaged research, you know, all the different res um, participatory research methods and approaches, and then specifically community-based participatory research. And it was also during that time that it also became much more clear that with community-based participatory research, um, it's very much about being authentic because the community can also pick up if it's one directional or where it's just about us wanting to come and collect data. They don't even understand the context, but you know, we arrange focus groups, questionnaires, they have to answer questions, but the beginning and the end of the process, <clears throat> the community knows nothing about. And, and it also talks about the valuing of all forms of knowledge, collaboration with the community for the co-creation of new knowledge, but also nurturing, um, not just establishing and building, but also nurturing relationships. And also looking at, as I've already alluded to, the building of relationships, of trust, but also looking at equity factors such as um, who makes the decisions, um, resources, <clears throat> as well as um, the strengths in terms of knowledge from each stakeholder. So it's um, after completing this course that the four of us then developed an engaged research short course for road staff, um, students, researchers, as well as community development practitioners. And the beauty of it was um, the community partner was part of the development team, and she's also facilitating in the engaged research short course that we offer. And, you know, and as I reflect on it as well, what was so beautiful was, um, you know, if we became too academic, she always pulled us back. So that's why the course itself is very balanced um, in terms of representing the community, but also academia. So with community-based participatory research, since the focus is also very much on the community identifying the problem and moving along in the research process, obviously we had to have engagements with the ethics review committee at our university. And from the get-go, they were very open and very supportive. And currently, the, the process that we follow is, for the initial engagement, um, you apply for what we call a scoping approval. Because when you go out to the community, you have no idea what the issues are, um, what the problems or what the research questions or methodology will be. So you apply for scoping approval, then you are able to make the initial engagement so that when your proposal is submitted, it's informed by the community. And at the same time, we also look at, and in this ends for the CBPR series of workshops for community partners and members. Uh, Monica, the community partner, coordinates this, and we um, facilitate with her on this. So we had a, a, a pilot with community members to get a feel from them in terms of research, what is it that they feel could, should be in such a course or that they would benefit from. So we piloted this year. And then the CBPR series of workshops for community members and partners um, will uh, officially be launched in 2023. 
And, you know, this whole journey then also made me become more aware and cognizant of the fact that um, collaboration and co-creation with the community becomes vital if we really want to bring about social change and for the community to take ownership. So for my own research around the integration of disaster risk management into development planning, um, this course and being on this trajectory of epistemic justice um, has added so much more value to my own research. And then I, um, I just included a few reflections from some of the participants that have um, completed the course. Um, so in this one, the person said it was an eye opener. Um, the, the research I conducted in the past was very much top down. And it's only after this engaged research course that I understand why my previous study was not participatory. Uh, in this one, this person reflected to say total involvement of the community in the research process and empowers the community to be responsible for their own development. And just the last two, um, this person said it helped me in terms of how I should view participants. And it made me realize the importance of participants taking an active role in identifying problems and being part of the process of finding the solutions. And in the last one, a person that works with teachers, he said, um, using this approach, the teachers now find it easy to express their challenges without fear of being judged, and they've basically taken ownership of it. And then just to sum up, just with this uh, series of workshops of community partners, you know, their reflections was very much about that um, spaces where community partners, partners and academics can interact to make it more holistic. And maybe to just finish off, um, as I said earlier about the learn, unlearn and relearn, this quote from Susan McQuiston also summed it up beautifully, that life is not black and white, life is a lot of gray. So when we are willing to unlearn and relearn, when we can hold space for both and thinking, then we can not only navigate the gray, but also learn to see all the beautiful colors in between. And my journey from traditional researcher to engaged researcher, I've seen so many beautiful rainbows along the way. So this just summed it up beautifully. And, and thank you for your time. Thank you, Rene. Thank you. And also, just to, to see, it's quite amazing to see that the code is not just a code in terms of learn and learn and relearn, but it's something that you critically reflect on. You have shared in terms of your experience and you've highlighted the areas where you felt you didn't do right with the community. It was more about on them, in them. However, now you appreciate that it's it's about a collaborative work working with the community be inclusive and i believe that your story will will is and it will continue to touch many students realize that they don't wait they have to wait until they graduate but some opportunities come whilst they're still studying thanks thanks for such a yeah informative uh, presented presentation ladies and gentlemen i just want to uh I once more invite you to ask questions and, and as I indicated, there's a chat there. You can also type if you, that's, you're more comfortable with that. So I'm going to pause here and allow people to ask questions if there's any at this point. Thank you. There's a comment there on the chat saying that it's not necessarily a question, but just applaud you for the wonderful work that you are doing with the community in terms of the practice part of it. Well done once more. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. Yes, we are not limited to questions. Even comments are appreciated, such as the one that we have just received. Thank you.
Okay, thank you, Rene. We'll release you now, and people, I believe, they will be in touch with you. Uh, yeah, beyond this uh, presentation, and who knows, some collaborative uh, work could also emerge from this presentation. Thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, we're going to move to our last speaker um, by the name of uh, Morris from the University of uh, uh, Frisch in Amsterdam, the Netherlands. So he, he he works with the uh, currently works in an innovative as an innovative manager research services at the University of Frisch in Amsterdam, and he is passionate about the multidisciplinary approach in terms of the work that they do in the library services. So we're going to hear more what they do in terms of Aurora SDG research data, I mean, a dashboard, gaining insight in co-author collaboration of SDG related research papers. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Morris and we're looking forward to hear what what is it that we can learn in terms of collaborative co-authorship in this context thank you over to you hi everybody thank you for uh for inviting me to this uh session uh and to uh giving me the opportunity to uh, present this uh project um and um, um so yes i i work at the uh, vrije universiteit in amsterdam uh um and uh i'm an innovation manager for uh at the library um and the presentation that i'm gonna give you is actually the very opposite of that we what we've seen before with the community based practice uh research uh but it's a more uh, it's a bibliometric uh a system where it's a very high level uh, view on uh, uh, on research uh, uh, that's been done uh, around the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals from the United Nations. Um, so uh, let me just introduce the uh, the organization, uh, the the high level organization where we work for. Um, so Aurora um, is a partnership of uh, like minded. Uh, collaborating uh, research intensive European universities um, uh, and what they will want to do is to um, uh, use their academic excellence to drive societal change uh, and contribute to the sustainable development goals so that's that's their statement that they want to make and the uh, many universities uh, 10 universities are involved in there so it's from uh, Iceland uh, in Amst uh, and in Amsterdam the Vrije Universiteit uh, in Copenhagen, uh, in uh, Paris, in Naples, uh, etc. You know, you name it. So these are many uh, universities, and uh, we've built a project where we work together uh, to solve um, a question, uh, and to uh, that starts with the collaborative statement. Um, uh, we want to solve uh, to see what what is uh, research in intensivity. We want to see what is uh, uh, academic excellence, what is uh, uh, driving societal change, and what is uh, how how do we contribute to the sustainable development goals? So, um, and we answered this question by putting uh, this data uh, together uh, by looking at uh, uh, scientific publications. So it's a, it's a very publication centric view of the world. Um, and there are many other factors, uh, that indicators that we use to uh, to answer the other uh, um, um, uh, proxies. So <clears throat> the objective of this project that we want to do is to, uh, to turn the uh, sustainable development goals into a leading narrative for the uh, for the research in uh, the Aurora Alliance. Um, and uh, we want to do this by uh, making uh, a dashboard. Uh, and making it robust and being used by uh, members of, in, inside the universities. And the second thing is that uh, we want to make this available for other universities to use as well, because um, what's the point in having this thing for ourselves <laughs> and not sharing it with others? So uh, we make everything uh, open source and available uh, online so you can build your own uh, dashboard. So this is the timeline uh what we uh, were talking about so first it's very technical 
so it's first, uh, we started with um, uh, a collection of uh, queries that we uh, did for each of the targets within the uh, sustainable development goals. We did this with uh, library search experts uh, and it's been validated by uh, 244 researchers uh, from the Aurora um, um, uh, universities. And then uh, we trained an artificial intelligence uh, uh, algorithm uh, to, um, uh, based on that data, uh, to identify a research in 104 languages. So it's not only uh, uh, restricted to the English um, uh, research domain, but we can extend to other uh, research domains. We made a service out of this, so you can uh, access this uh, um, online. It's, it's available uh, ex actually last week. And um, what we did then, we collected all our publications together uh, from these universities and classified it with the AI uh, to, to these um, uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, added some extra metrics to see also the uh, societal impact uh, and uh, put everything into a dashboard. It's, uh, it's available online and uh, we set up a sort of help desk where we can answer your questions. Um, so um, this is a presentation, uh, this is a video. I will uh, not uh, go into this, uh, but you can, uh, if I share the presentation, you can click on it and then you can uh, see the presentation, the video yourself. Uh, Someone to skip this, yeah. So first, uh, it's about the classifier. So um, this is how it looks like now. Uh, very simple, you insert a piece of text, you select a classification model. Uh, we train many others um, uh, by different definitions. You click on classify and then it comes up with a result. You can uh, get the result in, in the data as well. Uh, but also very interestingly, you can um, embed this as a badge on a web page. So what, what it can do for webmasters, you can um, uh, dynamically put this on, on web pages where you can dynamically uh, gives, gives you a, a circle with uh, how much uh, this text is related to which of the SDGs. Um, and we hope that this uh, will be useful for uh, making this a more into a net, the narrative uh, for uh, uh, how, how this research or maybe educational courses are related to uh, sustainable development goals. Um, so yes, this is uh, an example of how we put uh, these things on a website. So this is uh, the team. So I do this not by myself. I'm just uh, the project lead. Um, and uh, there are many experts uh, in this who, who, uh, who work together with uh, to make this happen. Uh, and I'm really thankful uh, for them to be in this project. Um, so now we'll show you a little bit about the project, uh, about the dashboard uh itself um and but uh, i will skip this video so you can look it uh, up yourself if you uh, if you want i will go through over it uh by this way so what we try to do is um this is the basically the dashboard um where it shows you um which universities contribute to what sdgs um and uh here it says how many publications are uh, we have collected together and how many of the publications are related uh, with 98% um, uh, certainty to uh, the uh, sustainable development goals. Um, yes, and here you can see uh, which of those uh, sustainable development goals uh, related publications are related to uh, the SDGs uh, for each university. Uh, also, we can drill down onto uh, faculty level. Um, Etc. So this is uh, uh, about the uh, the collaboration part because we we look into, into publications. They, we uh, we have also have co-authors of publications. So the interesting uh, thing is that uh, we can uh, look into uh, this by uh, a different view, where we could say uh, we could filter on uh, publications that have been co-authored by uh, co-authors from universities uh, in other countries. Um, and uh, also we can select uh, different uh, uh, groups of countries 
for example, here, uh, the least developing countries, uh, according to the United Nations. Um, and uh, yeah, well, uh, I will go into later, later into this if I have time to do a demo. Uh, also excellent, so uh, people are interested in how many uh, um, top citations uh, uh, researchers have for each of the SDGs. Um, how open accessible uh, these publications are. So it's uh, almost, yes, it's 50%, it's, uh, it should be more. Um, and this is a tool where, you, where we can help steering uh, this uh, with um, uh, opening up more, more and more of the publications that we, uh, that we do, um, making them freely available for, for the public. And this is the policy impact. Um, here we can see where uh, the um, um, research on the sustainable development goals we do are being picked up by uh, governments, non-governmental organizations, uh, think tanks, etc. Uh, putting it into policy, so to me, that, that, that so where it leaves science and it enters the societal um, uh, uh, dimension. Um, also, we we uh, we looked into uh, a diagram where we have uh, here we have an example uh, where we have excellent research on uh, SDG nine, um, where on on infrastructure, for example, uh, it's excellent research done, but it's not picked up by policymakers that much as uh, the other SDGs uh, have. So uh, we could steer more into uh, the publications and push them to policymakers, make them more aware that these papers are available um, and um, uh, uh, make them use uh, being useful in, in into policy. Um, then about collaboration. Uh, because this is the thing that uh, that you uh, uh, that you came for. So um, what we can do is uh, uh, with this uh, uh, tool, uh, we can show um, how we have the current co collaboration between two universities. Uh, but also, um, uh, you can type in um, um, companies where. Uh, partnership between private and um, uh, public private partnerships have been uh, doing for example um, companies like uh, Philips Unilever uh, uh, Heineken or whatever uh, um, uh, are related to for example S a certain SDG um, also we can uh, filter on the developing states for example uh, to see uh, where we collaborate with uh, in which countries and also uh, find um, potential collaboration. So if, if you are interested in uh, working together with a researcher on a certain topic in an SDG, um, you can uh, select an SDG, for example, uh, select a topic, and then uh, 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 there comes a list of uh, uh, researchers from the uni Aurora universities who work on that specific topic. Uh, you can uh, contact them to, to work with. Um, and then also the policy impact here. For example, uh, uh, I selected SDG 13 on climate action. Uh, it selects the climate action papers and it looks into where uh, that uh, those climate action papers uh, are uh, being cited into uh, policy uh, sources. So here, for example, the IPCC obviously uh, uh, use many of the papers that, uh, that we produce on SDG 13, climate action. Um, maybe it's uh, it's good to, um, if I have time left, to show a little demo, if it's still possible. Um, so here, this is the dashboard. Uh, we can go to the collaboration uh, module. Um, and let's see, two minutes. And now it's it's a shame it's it's loading this long um, because it's, uh, that's why I made slides, of course. <laughs> um, so luckily I made slides to show you uh, the, de the demonstration. So I think uh, this concludes my uh, presentation. If uh, you have uh, questions, uh, please uh, send me an email. Uh, I can be contacted here by this link uh, uh, below. Just uh, I give you the opportunity to, to write this down or type it in. Um, and there you can also show, uh, have the, um, the, are the resources on the dashboard, the videos, but also uh, a guide 
um, to build your own. Maybe it's also good to, uh, to show you this. Did it load? Yes. Um, so if you, if you go to um, Aurora, SAGs, um, here's a build guide. If you want to build it your own, you can uh, click on this and it explains how you can uh, build this yourself. Uh, but also how to use the dashboard uh, many uh, uh, guides available um, where it explains uh, what you can do with the, with the dashboard thank you i will leave it at that thank you thanks Maurice, for such a uh, yeah wonderful presentation it's interesting that when you started you indicated that you also would be a bit different however there's still synergy and link in relation to the work that others have presented given that even community work is linked to sdgs because we all working towards that in building a better society for us for all of us you spoke about societal changes. Those are issues that you look at. So is in community engagement solving problem and promoting academic excellence. And thanks once more for opening that opportunity to share in terms of other uh, colleagues, other um, uh, colleagues that may also want to explore this and see how they go about in terms of uh, uh, establishing their own dashboard. I uh, really, really appreciate the work that you are doing with your colleagues in Aurora. Thank you very much. This was great. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, again, I'm opening up for questions, comments. This is the time to, to do that. We still have time within, uh, we are way within our time in this session, given that all the speakers I must upload all of them. They were able to keep in time within the limited time that they were given. They presented excellent and informative uh, uh, session. Thank you. Questions, comments? There's a comment saying, thank you so much for the insight. It's going to help me in research. And I just started research work on UN SDGs. So there it is. And thanks for sharing that link. I can see it. Uh, you can go on the, on the virtual platform and see the link that Morris has shared if you want to continue in terms of the um, and collaboration and see how you can go about developing your own if you want to. Please check the, the, the virtual platform. There's a link that has been shared just now. Okay, I think there's no question at this point, uh, Morrison, yeah, I believe colleagues will yeah, take it uh, forward with you directly after this session. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Yeah, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the end of our session. And I just want to thank all of you, the presenters and also the participants. It has been great and wonderful to yeah, run with you in this session. It's been yeah, quite uh, uh, an informative insightful session i believe that much will come out of it there will be new links new collaboration with colleagues and i just want to thank you all and also thank the team behind the scene uh, uh miranda and the teams and colleagues behind the scene that have made this uh, uh, possible i just want to appreciate you thank you very much goodbye enjoy the rest of the sessions we still have more 
coming in other uh, sessions. So let's link and, and, and participate there actively as well. Thank you.